You are tuned into Evolutionary Radio TV edition. A PPAR agonist and why it is not a SARM. This is a great topic for a video, and this is a topic that I see so much misinformation on, so much confusion on, and so much bro science on. My goal with this video and my goal with this video series in general is to just keep it real. I want to take complicated scientific topics and break them down in a way that's easy to comprehend and easy to understand. No scientific mumbo jumbo, no need to add big words to make myself sound smart. There's no reason to make these, comp these concepts way more complicated than they really are. So first thing I'm going to say is make sure to watch the end of the video because at the end of the video I'm going to summarize everything I talk about in this video and the key take home points you need to know. So the first thing we need to do before we get into everything is we need to define these terms. So PPAR agonist. PPAR, that stands for Peroxisome Proliferator Activated Receptor. Agonist means to turn on. SARMS stands for Selective Androgen Receptor Modulator. Now the biggest difference between these two things is that a PPAR agonist is not a, hor a whole hormone. A SARM is a hormone, it binds the androgen receptor. So PPAR receptor, PPAR agonist does not possess any anabolic activity whatsoever. It does not bind to the androgen receptor. SARMs, however, are anabolic substances and do bind to the androgen receptor. Now, carterin. Carterin is often classified as a SARM, it's often sold as a SARM, it's often referred to as a SARM, but carterin is actually a PPAR agonist. It is not a SARM. Carterin is not a hormone. When you take carterin, basically what it does is it, it increases the expression of genes involved in fatty acid oxidation, cholesterol improvement by increasing HDL levels, decreasing LDL, decreasing total triglyceride levels, increasing muscle insulin sensitivity, improving blood glucose management, and also preventing the storage of fat cells, adipose sites. Pretty amazing, right? Carterin has a lot of science, uh, scientific, scientific data backing it. In 2007, they released a study that showed that the rats who took Carterin had improved endurance, decreased body fat levels, um, improved insulin muscle sensitivity in the rats who didn't take Carterin, and ever since, it's been one of the most popular drugs as a doping agent on the black market. In 2009, the WADA, which stands for World Anti-Doping Agency, added it to his list of banned substances. So if you're watching this video and you think, hey, Carterin sounds great, it's legal to purchase, and you're a drug tested athlete, unfortunately you won't be able to take it because it is on the WADA list of banned substances. So Carterin. Carterin has a half-life of about 20 to 24 hours. So because of that, you only need to take it once per day. The detection time of carterin, I would say, is roughly one month. The detection time is not known because it is such a new compound, but based on the half-life, I would estimate the detection time to be about one month. So that's basically carterin in a nutshell. The biggest thing to take home, the biggest take-home message of this video is that carterin is not a hormone. It will not suppress natural testosterone production. It will not suppress your HBTA. No post-cycle therapy is needed after using carterin. Carterin also is not a stimulant. It won't affect sleep, it won't raise cortisol levels or anything like that. The beauty of carterin is that it directly increases fatty acid oxidation. It directly burns fat in layman's terms. The problem with other fat burners, you know, things like clenbuterol, things like T3, is that they simply raise metabolism. They don't actually burn fat. Now with a faster metabolism, you will most likely burn fat, but you will also most likely burn muscle unless you're running a hefty dose of anabolics to prevent that muscle loss. Now for a big bodybuilder who's doing you know, a steroid cycle while using the clen and the T3, not an issue. But you know, for someone who doesn't want to use steroids, for a female, that's going to cause a big issue. You know, Other issues with things like clenbuterol and T3, T3, it can suppress your body's natural thyroid output. You know, you're gonna get a rebound effect when you stop using it. It's really not smart to play with your body's thyroid hormones. Your body regulates its thyroid hormones and keeps them in a very, very delicate balance. Clenbuterol, anyone who's used clenbuterol knows it's terrible for causing insomnia. It's 
terrible for causing muscle cramps, and you're going to get a lot of side effects. The side effects from Cartarin are pretty much non-existent. Um, every time someone hears Cartarin, they bring up cancer. I'm going to address this quickly because, in my opinion, it's way overblown. So first of all, the study used rats. For whatever reason, rats develop cancer way easier than humans. That's why rats are always used in cancer studies. You cannot compare different mammals and their rates of getting cancer. Certain mammals, like dolphins, don't get cancer at all, right? So, I mean, if you gave a drug to a dolphin and it didn't give it, it didn't cause cancer, you, you can't say, well, then that means if we give it to a human, it won't cause cancer either. Well, nothing will, will, get, will make a dolphin get cancer, right? So rats develop cancer very, very easily. Second thing, they gave the rats an absurd dosage. If you take an absurd dosage of anything, you're going to develop cancer. There's a famous saying, everything is poison, it's the dosage that determines whether or not it's lethal. So I mean, taking a Tylenol, not going to hurt you. Taking a bottle of Tylenol per day, do that for a couple weeks, you're probably going to develop some side effects. The last thing I'm going to say is that the rats didn't actually develop cancer. Basically, they injected all the rats with a gene that would cause them to develop cancer. The group that was given the carterin just developed the cancer at a slightly faster rate than the group that was not given the carterin. And if you run the statistics, it was like just statistically relevant. So I mean, it caused them to develop cancer at a faster rate that was so minimal, it was almost statistically relevant. So again, do your own research. Everyone is in control of their own bodies. I'm not telling you, you know, take my information as a gospel, but in my opinion, Cardarin is perfectly safe. So I'm going to talk about SARMs. So SARMs are similar to steroids, but they're much more selective in their method of action. That's why they're called selective androgen receptor modulators. Now, there's a big mis in, uh, misconception floating around that SARMs are completely anabolic substances. That's technically not true. SARMs do have some androgenic properties, but the androgenic properties are so minuscule, it's pretty much negligible. The most androgenic SARM, RAD140, only has one-tenth of the androgenic properties of testosterone. So the androgenic properties are very, very minuscule, which makes SARMs a great option for females because it's the androgenic properties that promote virilization, a development of male sexual characteristics. So a woman can take SARMs and there's no risk of her developing, you know, facial hair, clitoris enlargement, voice deepening, any of those side effects. One thing I need to point out about SARMs is that they're not near the strength of steroids. So if your goal is to, you know, look like Ronnie Coleman, you're not going to get those, you're not going to get those results from SARMs. But on the other hand, for the average person watching this video who just wants to put on five to 10 pounds, you know, get a nice six pack, look lean, get that, you know, nice male cover model body, you can totally achieve those goals with SARMs. Another nice thing about SARMs is they do not convert into any of the unwanted products. They do not convert into DHT, they do not aromatase into estrogen, and they do not increase prolactin levels in the body. So side effects like gynecomastia, side effects like water retention, they're impossible with SARM usage. The last thing I'm gonna say when it comes to PPA or agonists like Carterin and SARMs is that there no, there's no regulation on these compounds. Basically, they're legal to be sold as a research chemical. As soon as that company puts for research purposes only on the label, it's not regulated by the FDA and they can legally put whatever they want in that product and sell it. So do a lot of research before ordering from any source. Again, that's why you hear so much mixed reviews on SARMs, Carterin, things like that. Person A will say, hey, I use Carterin. I loved it. I got great fat loss. I got great endurance from it. Person B will say, I used it. I got nothing from it. Person B was probably using fake cardamom. So do your research before ordering from any source. And again, this is the summary. These are the take home points you need to know. A PPR agonist like cardamom is not a hormone. It will not cause any sort of HBTA suppression. It will not affect natural testosterone production. No post cycle therapy is required after it. After a cycle of cardamom, you don't need to take anything. That's the beauty of cardamom. No support supplements are needed. The last take home point you need to know 
is that cardarin will increase endurance, it will increase fat loss, but it is not a stimulant. It won't affect sleep and it won't affect cortisol levels. So the time of day you take cardarin doesn't matter. And that's the real beauty of cardarin is you can get all the fat loss prop, all the fat loss benefits with none of the side effects. So that's basically the video. Please hit me up on any of my social media platforms. Let me know if you love this video, if you hated this video, comments, suggestions, topics for other videos you want me to do. I want to hear from you. Send me a message and I promise I'll get back to you. Thank you for watching.